Good morning, and welcome to Boiler Room Basics 101, the aerators and surge tanks. My name is Alan Silver. I'm one of the national account managers here at SCC, and I will be presenting today. This presentation is one of a number of Boiler Room Basic presentations that we will be presenting going forward. We look forward to our continuing education series and hope you find the information helpful and useful. Uh, this presentation will be recorded for future viewing and provided on our YouTube channel. You will receive an email following the presentation should you like to revisit or provide to others in your organization. That being said, let's do a little uh, housekeeping. When you uh, find in, you should have a toolbar here to your left with a little orange arrow key. If you click on that, you'll have a larger toolbar open up and um, make sure your audio is selected computer audio so you can hear what I'm saying. We'll also have a couple other bars down below. One is questions. Click on that. You'll be able to type in a question in this area and then hit send right here. And then we'll compile those questions and get back to you uh, as soon as we can. Uh, if you'd like for somebody to give you a call, simply um, add your cell phone or your phone number to your question and we will get back to you um, via phone as well. Okay. Also in the handout section, you'll be able to click there and uh, download the PowerPoint presentation that we'll be reviewing today, as well as technical documents for our deaerator and surge tank control panels. All right. With that being said, I'd like to kind of start out an overview of a typical surge tank deaerator layout. Uh, we want to start off with the basics of the surge tanks and deaerators in a boiler room because they're some of the largest auxiliary equipment that you're going to find typical steam plant. And in my opinion, they're one of the most important pieces of equipment. I kind of look at the DA tank as the, as the heart of the boiler room. Um, you're, you're, you're preparing the water uh, prior to entering the boilers and uh, making sure everything runs efficiently and, uh, and the equipment is taken care of and lasts a long time. So that being said, we'll go ahead and, and kind of follow this, uh, this drawing, this, this layout starting from right to left here under the softened or treated makeup water uh, coming into a surge tank. Um, surge tanks, by the way, are atmospheric tanks normally. Um, as a result, they'll have a vent to make sure that any steam that does enter the surge tank via some type of fail trap or whatever uh, is not going to pressurize the vessel. Instead, we'll just vent up the, up the vent pipe. Okay. Um, other things that will come into uh, the surge tank could be low pressure or pumped condensate returns. I always make this gold because I like to think of condensate as, as liquid gold. Um, here I'm measuring the temperature of uh, the makeup water and the temperature of the condensate, as well as the temperature in the surge tank. I'll tell you why we do that in a little while. It's uh, very important to understand those three temperature sensors uh, are important in, in, in evaluating how your surge tank is doing and how much condensate return you have coming back. We also have a level transmitter here and some level switches, possibly a high level, a low, and a low low. Uh, the low low typically shutting the pumps off um, at that point to keep them from damaging themselves. Then obviously you have the pumps themselves, it could be motor starter or VFD control, and a pressure sensor on the discharge manifold of the transfer pumps. From there, we go into the deaerator with a makeup valve to control the level in the deaerator. Now, if you have um, your softened or treated water going directly to the DA, um, this valve may actually just be controlling the level in the surge tank. Depending on how your control system is, is made up, um, these valves may be in different locations. But if you're if you're feeding deaerator, uh, your deaerator directly softened or treated makeup water, um, you'll also want to look at having a makeup water meter in this case. Other things that go into the deaerator are your main steam or flash steam. As a result, the aerators are typically ASME Section 8 vessels. They're normally registered with the National Board of Pressure Vessel Inspectors. Notice here there's a vent section, an orifice or some type of throttle valve or needle valve. Make sure that we get enough venting to properly remove the dissolved gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide, primarily from the deaerator. Okay. We're also here again. High pressure trap returns off of drip legs from your main steam header or other locations uh, are another good place to uh, to tie into the DA um, to help eliminate losses due to flash steam. Again, overflow trap, want to keep the steam in the deaerator. 
and uh, and trap the water or, or drain the water to a safe location. In high, low, and low, low level switches, protect the pumps and to um, make sure that the deaerator doesn't get flooded and and have issues. Okay. You also have your feed water pumps. Now the discharge of your feed water pumps, we have a flow meter and a pressure transducer. These can also be motor starter or VFD controlled. We'll talk a little bit about um, why you would want to use a variable speed, speed drive on your feed water system shortly as well. Okay. So why do you want to use a deaerator? This is always a good question. And before we can really answer that properly, we have to ask ourselves some other questions. In this case, what is oxygen pitting corrosion and how does it affect low alloy steel? Well, iron is found in nature, typically in some form of an oxide. Mother Nature likes to uh, take things down to their basic forms. And in this case, Fe203, Fe304, iron oxides are a very stable form found in nature. Uh, for y'all want to know, for any of y'all that want to know what Fe is, it comes from the Latin word meaning ferrum. Ferrum is translated from Latin to English as iron. Okay. Now, when iron is processed into steel, it loses its oxygen and becomes pure iron. Okay. When in the presence of water and oxygen, the natural reaction is to return back to an oxide, commonly known as corrosion, and this, thus the steel is attacked. Okay, so uh, unfortunately in a boiler, we have a lot of steel, we have a lot of water, we have uh, hopefully no oxygen, but if that does happen, uh, oxygen pitting can occur. The electrochemical process is localized at one of the numerous anode and cathode sites that exist on the metal surface. This type of localized corrosion results in pitting. Okay. I'm going to show you here when, uh, whenever you inspect your boiler, if you see curvicles or signs of localized pitting corrosion on your boiler. In this specific photo, you can tell where some pitting corrosion has occurred and may have stopped or may still be underway. When you're inspecting your boiler, look for little bumps or blisters or other abnormal growths on your boiler tubes. Typically, that's an indication that there is oxygen pitting going on. This could happen to you. This is a two inch diameter, 0 0.095 inch wall thickness tube operating 100 PSI pressure that was in service for only 14 days. If you notice the metal around the pit has been significantly degraded. Uh, so this area is really not repairable. So once you've totally penetrated the tube wall, water is going to be flowing out or into the tube, depending on your boiler design. And for the most part, you're going to have to replace that tube, okay, or plug it, one or the other. So, oxygen pitting corrosion results in what? Well, first of all, loss of boiler operation. Obviously, if you got water spraying out into the fire side of your boiler, that's not a good thing, right? So we want to, uh, we have to make sure we, we get that fixed as quickly as possible. That doesn't require that you actually shut the boiler down and depressurize it. At the same time, you're losing your boiler, you're probably losing plant, plant production. And this is pretty significant, especially if you're in the business of making money like the rest of us are. Um, plant production is, is key, right? Plus, excessive repair costs to the boiler. But typically, if you have one boiler with oxygen pitting, you more than likely have a number of others. And uh, replacing tubes in a fire tube or a water tube boiler can be in the tens of thousands of dollars, if not in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. Loss of revenue, obviously, when you're not creating product at your facility, you're losing revenue. So every day is, could be tens or if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost revenue. And as a result of that lost revenue, it could result loss of employment. Um, loss of employment probably be the worst thing that can happen in this case. So oxygen pitting. So let's talk a little bit about carbon dioxide. What is it and where does it come from? Carbon dioxide is an odorless and colorless gas that is soluble in water. Carbon dioxide found in steam plants generally originates from the decomposition of carbonate and bicarbonate alkalinity found in the makeup water. When carbon dioxide combines with water, carbonic acid is created, lowering the pH and increasing corrosion rates, especially in the presence of oxygen. 
So carbon dioxide and oxygen are like uh, like the little rascals. If you have one of them, you could probably be hang out with them and, uh, and and take control. But when they get together, they can increase corrosion rates as high as 40% higher than normal with just CO2 or oxygen present. So uh, having a CO2 and oxygen in contact with low low alloy steels can be uh, pretty uh, destructive. Um, in your soda that you drink. Um, Carbon dioxide is added to enhance the, the drinking experience and uh, and give your your taste buds a little a little kick so that you can uh, really enjoy the sugar that you're you're drinking down there. But um, in the in you know if you if you were to look at the pH of that soda, um, typically they range anywhere from 2.5 to 3.5, which can be anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 times more acidic than neutral water. So uh, carbon dioxide is a is a, something we really want to Think about especially in the condensate steam and condensate system because there is where the co2 will combine back with water as a liquid and form that carbonic acid okay since the aerators move most of the soluble co2 gas that's in the makeup water okay most co2 in the steam and condensate system comes from carbonate and bicarbonate alkalinity and can cause generalized corrosion in the steam and condensate system so we now know that oxygen and carbon dioxide are bad actors. Let's talk a little bit about how gases affect heat transfer, okay? Air is used as an excellent insulator. Typical piping insulation is just a maze of small pockets of air contained by plastics, fiberglass, etc. okay? If air or other gases are allowed to enter the boiler and steam system, the filming effect of the gas between the water and the steel can create a significant reduction in heat transfer. If anyone has a double pane window at their house, normally you have two pieces of glass and what's in the middle is air. Okay, air is just a very good insulator. And if you can imagine, if it gets between the steam and the pipe surface wall, um, you can have significant reduction in heat transfer and also an elevated metal temperature as well. The other double whammy if you get air in a steam system is if it leaves the boiler with the steam, the effect for any given pressure results in an actual temperature lower than that for the given saturation pressure. Okay, that reduces the heat transfer due to lower differential temperature. So big picture there, it means if you are operating at, let's say 100 PSI, you'd expect saturation temperature of the steam to be around 337 degrees. If air gets in the steam, and you have a mixture now of steam and air, um, the law of partial pressures will actually result in a steam, in a, a mixture temperature lower than 337 degrees, maybe 325 degrees, or depending on how much air you have in that mixture. And that can actually reduce the heat transfer because heat transfer is proportional to pressure, temperature differential and mass law. That's why air vents in your process system should always be evaluated, okay? Now we can talk about some of the functions of a deaerating seawater tank. We know that oxygen pitting is bad. CO2 is bad for your condensate system in, in general corrosion. And we know that air can cause heat transfer issues in your process heat exchangers. So first function, removal of oxygen and carbon dioxide and other non-condensable gases from the boiler feed water. We try to get the O2 in a deaerator down less than seven parts per billion. Make up water around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, you can have as much as eight to nine parts per million of oxygen. A deaerator will reduce that down to less than seven parts per billion or over a thousand times less concentration. That reduces chemical usage and improves system heat transfer um, significantly. So in doing so, in removing those oxygen carbon dioxide and air molecules from the water or other non-condensable gases. In doing so, we use steam. And, in, and as a result, we end up preheating the feed water and that helps to reduce thermal shock to the boilers. We also have a location now at the deaerator pipe high pressure condensate returns, steam header drip legs, for instance. So uh, if any of you know much about flash steam, you know that in a saturated system, the water going from a higher pressure to a lower pressure will flash off steam to get back to its saturation temperature at the lower pressure. In ambient, obviously it's 212 degrees. 
So in those cases where high pressure condensate returns can result in flash steam, putting it into the generator is a great place to eliminate that flash steam loss and recover any water associated with the steam. It also gives us a location to add chemicals for boiler feed water treatment, oxygen scavengers like sulfites, for instance. Okay. Also gives us a location to add makeup water. Also provides the net positive suction head required for feed water pumps. Now there's a difference between net positive suction head required and net positive suction head available. So uh, you wanna make sure that the available net positive suction head height or pressure on the suction side of the pump is high enough to prevent cavitation, which could cause damage to the feed water pump, transfer pump impellers, and, um, and result in loss of feed water flow. Also gives a location to return flash steam. Down flash steam heat recovery systems, for instance. They're very important in helping you maintain a highly efficient boiler room. It helps keep keeps you from losing flash steam out to the environment. And also helps to reduce blowdown water temperatures um, by preheating incoming feed water or makeup water um, to your surge tank. We also have a river reserve water storage in the case of makeup water loss. Typically, most deaerators are, are designed for about 10 minutes, typically based upon estimated steam capacity. So if you lose your makeup water source for whatever region, at least you have some time to react um, before you actually lose all the water in the DA tank. It does give you some reserve water storage capacity. Let's talk about the surge tank, for instance, and where you might use one. Um, storage space for fluctuating condensate loads that the DA tank cannot handle without overflowing. So if you have a large steam and condensate system and you have variable loads like uh, laundry starting up or autoclave starting up, or if you have kitchens and, and um, at lunchtime and dinner time and breakfast time, different times you're, you're having variable loads and the deaerator is not capable of handling the condensate that comes back initially uh, from those loads. And a surge tank is a great piece of equipment to have to ensure that you don't overflow water, lose water, chemicals, and heat down the drain. This gives you a location to pipe low pressure condensate and or pump condensate returns. It also gives you a location to add makeup water. And a lot of times nowadays, we're seeing more and more people arranging their piping and sizing their feed water and transfer pumps such that if the boiler feed water system is, fails from the DA, for instance, um, you can use the surge tank as a backup emergency feed water system to your boilers. If you do so, you'll definitely want to have a makeup water valve or the surge tank in this case. We also uh, can preheat makeup water to the deaerator in the surge tank to reduce thermal shock. Um, kind of interesting when you start looking at deaerator inspections um, by the National Board of Pressure Vessels uh, the inspectors, they have actually noted at some point, at one point in time, between 30 to 50 percent of all deaerators that they inspected in a year's time had cracks in them, typically in the radial or longitudinal seam of the tank. It's pretty scary when you think um, how much water you have in there, you know, at, at, at a temperature and pressure above the boiling point. So we have a kind of an idea on why you might want to use a deaerator. Okay, chemical reduction, preheating of the feed water, storage locations, and things like that. Let's talk about some of the instrumentation that we want to possibly have on our tanks. Okay. In this case, I have little squares around the makeup water meter, our condensate return temperature, our makeup water temperature, and then the temperature of the water in the surge tank. Okay, let's talk about some of those items and why we might want to have those um, to monitor. Makeup water meters, proactive means of monitoring water loss in the plant, also provide the mean to, means to evaluate project improvements. Lower makeup water means you get more condensate return. Higher makeup water means I have more losses. So if you have a problem out in your plant where you have a leak or you have a trap that's blowing by or you have some other source of steam losses in the plant, um, what's gonna happen is you're gonna see more makeup water coming into your, your plant. But if you don't have a makeup water meter, it's very difficult to determine if that's the case, okay? 
Um, also, uh, that makeup water meter is going to help help your engineer develop some cost improvement projects down the road. So temperature sensors, makeup, condensate, and surge tank temperatures. So along with the makeup water meter meter itself, this enables you to determine the volume of condensate return. So measuring condensate return is very difficult uh, because it's typically mixed phase, it's both water and a vapor. So if anybody can find a meter that can do both of those things and give me gallons per minute, I'd love to hear about it. Um, typically what we do is we calculate condensate return. In this case, um, we're gonna use the makeup water meter and some temperature sensors. So how do we do that? Pretty simple. Condensate return in gallons is simply the makeup water that you're measuring with your makeup water meter here in gallons times the difference in makeup water and surge tank temperature divided by the difference in surge tank temperature and condensate return. Okay, very easy to do. Once you've calculated the, the amount of gallons of condensate return, it's easy then to calculate your condensate return percentage. It's your gallons divided by your condensate return gallons plus your makeup gallons times 100. Now having that condensate return percentage extremely important. Um, why is it important to know? Well, it enables the water treatment professional. It's actually helping you maintain clean heat transfer surfaces, and they, they, helping you maintain uh, the equipment life uh, as long as it can, or live as long, as long as it can. It enables him to determine how much water you're using and subsequently how much chemicals are required to treat that water. It's important to establish annual chemical budgets. Okay. Also helps diagnose steam or condensate losses in the process or steam plant, as we talked about earlier. Also allows the utility engineer to develop energy savings projects like trap maintenance or replacement, for example, uh, and then to measure the results. Because once he has um, actually Im imposed the project where he's placed traps or repaired trap systems, you can then calculate how much money he saved. How do you do that? Be simple. Your condensate return increase, however many gallons a year you save, times the difference in condensate return temperature versus your makeup water temperature. Multiply that times 8.34 pounds per gallon, and that gives you your total BTUs per year saved. Then your total BTUs per year saved, divided by 1 million BTUs per decatherm, times your cost per decatherm, divided by your boiler efficiency, is going to give you dollars per year saved. Okay. But without that meter, without those temperature sensors, very difficult thing to do. Now let's look at the deaerator, just real briefly. Um, again, if you're feeding makeup water directly to the deaerator, you want a makeup water meter. Obviously, you always want to measure your condensate return temperatures. Here, measuring that temperature could give you an indication if you have a trap blowing by and you're blowing steam directly back to the DA tank, that temperature reading is going to go up. Also, your pressure and temperature of the deaerator, the steam and the water, your saturated system here, as well as if you have or if you can install a common feed water meter to your boilers, that also is very important. We're going to go over why that might be the case in just a second. Deaerator instrumentation, makeup water meter. Again, proactive means of monitoring water loss in the plant. If you don't have one, how do you know what's going on? Okay. Lower makeup water percentage means more condensate return. Higher makeup water percentage means more losses. Very simple. Temperature and pressure sensors. Makeup, condensate, and DA tank temperatures along with DA pressure. If the temperature of the water in the DA is close to saturation temperature associated with the steam pressure in the DA, something is wrong. In other words, if you have five PSI in your DA reader, that correlates to a saturation temperature of approximately 227 degrees Fahrenheit. If for some reason the water temperature in your deaerator is only 180 degrees, something is wrong. We're not getting the proper heat transfer, and if we're not getting proper heat transfer, we're not getting proper deaeration. Okay, so just having those two gauges, temperature and pressure, are very important. Um, also, highly recommend if you're just doing gauges where you're having a temperature gauge and a pressure gauge that you replace those, you know, every couple of years or else get them calibrated if possible. With temperature and pressure gauges are pretty inexpensive. Um, we would rather put temperature sensors and pressure sensors so we can then take that information back to a control panel and then send that on to your building automation system for uh, your engineers to take a look at. Feed water flow meter, something that a lot of people don't use that often, 
Um, but nowadays with some new technology, um, much, much easier to install feed water flow meters um, because the difference in feed water flow and makeup water flow is equal to your condensate return. Very simple. And if you have a total steam flow meter in the plant after your boilers, the difference between feed water flow and steam flow is equal to your blowdown. And that's very important, especially if you're trying to evaluate whether or not a blowdown heat recovery system is viable or economical for your system. Okay. Some examples of sensors and meters. Makeup water flow meters. We love the magnetic flow meter. Humans manufacturers on a very nice mag flow meters for, and they have a high temperature version for feed water applications. They're very accurate. They have very low pressure drops. And um, they're, they work in, in many, many different applications other than just feed water. The meters that we're really seeing a lot of nowadays are what we call clamp-on ultrasonic. This eliminates the need to penetrate the pipe and weld in flanges or any of that kind of thing where you have to do that with a magnetic flow meter. You simply prepare the surface of the pipe, install the transducers at the appropriate distance, and then set up your electronics controller, and now you have feed water flow. You don't even have to shut the plant down for that to happen. Temperature sensors. Typical RTDs or thermocouples with or without transducers um, are, are just fine. Pressure transducers, you can get a fixed range pressure transducer or a variable range pressure transducer, whatever you feel comfortable with or whatever your plant standardized on. And then obviously, differential pressure transducers for level and or flow measurement. Most differential pressure transducers out there nowadays have a square root function that allows you to utilize them in orifice plates or venturis or other types of differential pressure measuring applications. The nice thing is, too, we can provide all of them to you, okay? along with a system that can take that information and make it available to the plant engineering system. What kind of aerators are there out there? I'm just going to go over a few typical uh, types. The spray type is very typical out there in uh, intermediate size steam plants. So basically, water is sprayed into the DA tank to increase the contact surface with the steam. Okay, we want to maximize how much steam comes in contact with the water that you end in there. Um, and this can be either a fixed orifice design or a variable orifice design. Continuous integral recirculation is also available with certain designs where you simply have an integral pump that transfers water from one section of the tank to the another section of the tank so that you're continuously dairying even if you're not uh, under a very high load. That column in a lot of these over the years. Again, in order to increase the surface contact area with the steam, makeup water is run through a column that has packed corrosion resistant inserts installed. Then we have the tray, tray type, which is very typical out there. Also, water is run over a series of trays, almost like a champagne fountain, right? And uh, they overflow and create a thin film of water, thus increasing the surface contact area of the water with the steam. And, uh, and also, minimizing the path those gases have to take to get out of the water. So, uh, typically, tray type deaerators can handle a much higher load. You can see those often, those are often found in power plants and larger industrial plants. So, deaeration involves time, temperature, hopefully saturation temperature, turbulence, and then good venting with minimal loss of steam. So all these things have to come into play in order to get the water up to saturation temperature as quickly as possible so that those gases are released and then the pressure in the deaerator will push those gases out the vent pipe and uh, and hopefully reduce the oxygen concentration in the deaerator to less than seven parts per billion. Let's talk a little bit about where to add up, where to add makeup water in a DA and surge tank. Okay, some manufacturers believe that raw treated makeup water, all the water that's raw, and it's treated for either from your softener or from your pretreatment equipment should be fed to the DA tank to minimize surge tank corrosion. Okay, because in a surge tank, if you when you add cold water to hot condensate, you're going to liberate a lot of oxygen in the surge tank, and that can create some corrosion issue. Other manufacturers believe the makeup water should be fed to the surge tank in order to preheat the makeup water. Okay, preheating makeup water to the deaerator may sound uh, kind of strange, but uh, like I said previously, the National Board of Pressure Vessels has found a number of cracks in deaerators over the years, a lot of times due to thermal stresses 
and also due to um, excessive thermal cycling. So in the case where the surge tank is making makeup water, you can't undergo significant corrosion due to high levels of oxygen liberated, just as we spoke of before, as the makeup water contacts the hot condensate. As a result, the condensate tank is often made of a corrosion resistant material like stainless steel, or else the internals are coated with corrosion resistant materials. Oftentimes, a DA tank may also have an internal coating, like a baked epoxy, for instance. So, how do we evaluate your DA performance? A daily log. The DA pressure and temperature. Compare those two to saturation temperature for that, uh, for that specific pressure. Again, it should be within maybe three to four degrees as far as the water goes. Look at the DA level. Check out your feed water surge tank pump discharge pressure. Makeup water usage. Record all these things on a daily basis. Visually and audibly observe for operation. Make sure that you're not overflowing water down the drain. Make sure your pumps and piping are not leaking. Chemical feed line not leaking. Listen for abnormal noise such as pump cavitation. If you haven't heard of pump cavitate before, it's uh, it's been described by many people as, as a pump with a bunch of marbles bouncing around in there. But really what's happening is you're creating a steam bubble and subsequently that steam bubble is collapsing. That can damage impellers and a number of other internals to the pump, right? So we don't, we don't want cavitation to happen. So just listen for abnormal noise. Typically, DA water should be within four degrees, like we said earlier. So at five PSI and 227, your, your water in the tank should be at least 223 or higher. Make sure the DA tank is vented properly. This can be done visually at the point where the vented gases and some steam leave the insulated vent pipe. Notice I mentioned said insulated vent pipe because we want that pipe to be insulated so the steam that is leaving doesn't condense and drip back down the pipe. And then conduct a semi-annual dissolved oxygen test. This is something that your chemical provider can do for you to make sure that the DA is actually performing to its specifications. You conduct internal inspections of your DA, ensure internal components are not damaged and cracks are not developing. Well, if not, you gotta crawl inside that thing at least every couple of years. Um, problem is that a lot of times you can't shut the plant down and if you only have one deaerator that that becomes a problem because you can't shut the plant down unless you rent a deaerator and then do the inspection or else if you have a surge tank that has the capability of acting as a feed water system for your boilers you can make it very difficult um internal inspections on deaerators i find is neglected and it should be uh, just as important as inspecting the internals of your boiler you check your vent visually to make sure it's not clogged or sputtering water. So here at the exit of this pipe, if you see water sputtering out, that's telling me that the steam is condensing in the pipe. You don't have high enough velocity to get rid of those non-condensable gases. Your deaerator is probably not performing up to its specification. Okay, where is this pipe? Typically, it's on the roof somewhere. So somebody's going to have to crawl up there and um, with a harness and, and take a look. With that being said, let's talk about some of our uh, DA and surge tank control solutions at SCC. We've been developing these products for a number of years now and have quite a few installed out in the field. Um, this is a typical overview screen of our um, DA control panel. In this case, we have a dual tank where we have a DA and a surge tank in one enclosure. There's a pressure vessel partition in between the two. Here we have two transfer pumps. The transfer pumps feed to the deaerator section, um, and then the feed water pumps obviously pump to the boilers. Both have level controls associated with them, high, low, and low, low cutouts. We're controlling, in this case, we're controlling feed water pressure to 155 PSI and the transfer pump pressure to 45 PSI. Very brief overview of what our DA panel might look like. Some of the features and functions of our DA control panel. Universal control panel suited for multiple DA and surge tank applications, up to six pumps. We are evaluating and are in the process of upgrading our software to allow up to eight pumps. But this is a standard off-the-shelf product. It's not a special. We uh, we have these products available in, in lead times from three to three to four weeks. And um, we can use this control panel with any manufacturer's deaerator or surge tank. And we have done so in the past. We auto-rotate 
pumps on a time basis to ensure even runtime for up to six pumps. Again, the future will be eight pumps. We also lead lag pumps. We start and stop pumps as needed to maintain feed water header pressure or differential pressure between the feed water header and the steam header. Okay, so lead lag operations basically mean we have a lead pump and it's going to try and maintain the header set point. If we need more pressure or if the pump is not able to make it on its own, we'll start a lag pump. Okay, and if those two pumps aren't able to handle it on their own, then we'll start another lag pump. And those uh, pumps are sequenced in a certain order and the lead pump is rotated on a certain time basis that the operator can uh, adjust. And I'll show you where that's done here shortly. We also have the ability to control pumps via motor starters or via variable speed drives to save energy and to reduce operating costs. I'll talk to you a little bit about variable speed drives uh, in just a moment. Accurate control of water level. That's very important in a deaerator and a surge tank is to maintain your water level to minimize overflow possibilities, reduce makeup water, reduce sewer usage, reduce chemical waste and energy waste, and to also ensure that you maintain a net positive suction head, obviously for your, for your pumps. We also have the ability to remote monitor all the pump status, water level, deaerator pressure, feed water pressure, and other temperatures and flows via multiple protocols. We also have the ability to connect to an SCC master panel for single point VAS connection. Okay. Also with the master panel, when we, when we do connect to DA, we can, we can do some math functions. We call uh, uh, just some, some basic user script to do some of the math, like calculate condensate return based upon those flows, makeup water flows and temperatures. And you can actually calculate that and trend it um, at the master panel. It's kind of neat. Multiple graphics are available in one program. When you configure this DA or your, uh, control panel or this DA rate or surge tank control panel, there's no specific graphic that uh, it comes with. As you tell it how many pumps are on the DA tank and how many pumps are on the surge tank and what kind of tank you have and whether it's a spray type nozzle or if it's a, a, a tray type uh, DA rater, then uh, it'll automatically build that graphic for you as you select those in the setup menu. So here's a typical DA rater spray type with a PRV maintaining five PSI with three feed water pumps. Obviously the one green is on, it's a lead pump. We have a lag one, lag two, and lag three. Okay. On the same program, we can have a surge tank. If you have a combination where you have a DA and a surge tank that are separate, then you can have it, when you do that in the setup, then you will automatically configure the graphic as well as the number of transfer pumps that you have. We also have a combination, like I showed earlier. Here's a spray type deaerator with a surge tank as part of the single tank. Okay. Or we can have a DA tank standalone with trays. At least the graphic that you are developing as you build and configure the DA panel will look like what you have installed at your plant. Auto rotation of the pumps and start and stop delay. The one thing about lead lagging pumps is that you don't want to start them too often. You don't want to start a pump 15 times, you know, every minute. Um, so we have start delays, and stop delays for the pumps. We also have minimum run times for the pumps so that we don't cycle these pumps on and off too much, thereby damaging the motor windings by overheating and those types of things. We also have an alternation time for lead lag um, and then an overlap time when the lag one becomes the lead and when the lead becomes the next lag pump. That way you don't see any change in discharge pressure. Um, all you know is that the pumps are being run as needed and they're even the run time on each, each pump. We have multiple lead lag operating modes. In this case, we are gonna operate the deaerator based upon a feed water pressure set point of 100 PSI. The actual pressure will be right here and we can control the variable speed drives for the pumps to add a pump when the total PID output is 95% and drop a pump when the total PID output is 85%. Okay, we can also do what we call set point offset where we actually measure the pressure of the steam header and compare it to the pressure um, offset 
And the difference between these two or the addition of these two is your set point. So here's 127 plus 30 is 157. And we'll try and control to that. Now, why is that so important? Okay. Well, if you look at a typical steam plant where you have multiple boilers, um, we will come in and measure the pressure of the feed header. And we'll also measure the pressure in the steam header. For instance, if one of the boilers pressure controls was to fail and the pressure begins to rise, it could potentially rise above the pressure set point of the feed water header by itself. But by measuring both, we always make sure that as this pressure increases, which is the steam header pressure will increase, that the corresponding set point for the feed water will also increase and ensure water flow to all boilers. Very important. And then we have a basic motor starter type of arrangement. We will have a feed water pressure set point and we'll add a pump if the pressure drops below a certain value and we'll drop that pump if it rises above a certain value. Very simple on off pump control um, with lead lag control. Okay, energy savings using BFPs. Boiler feed water pumps have some of the largest motors that you're gonna find in the boiler room, okay? Most of the time they're larger than the blower motor horsepower, transfer pump motors, et cetera. So utilizing a variable frequency drive is a great way to reduce your energy consumption by only operating the number of pumps needed at the speed necessary to maintain proper feed water flow to the boilers. Reduced inrush current and better power factors are additional benefits. The big formula we want to look here is really power. So power varies as the speed cubed. So the power at a lower speed is equal to the power at 60 hertz times the RPM or speed at a lower frequency divided by the speed at 60 hertz. All of that to the third power. So simply dropping or reducing speed of a pump 10 hertz can save you nearly 50% of the power consumed. Okay. Some other formulas you may be familiar with or head or pressure, discharge pressure varies as the speed squared and then flow changes linear speed. Setting up the DFD in our control panel is very easy. You simply select the DFD option and you tell it whether or not the DFDs will be used with the feed water pumps or the transfer pumps by selecting yes or no. Once you do that, you simply hit touch the pump PID configuration and you can set up your proportional integral and derivative values um, to control set point of the discharge manifold or in the case of set point offset, fixed differential between the steam header and the feed water header. We also have accurate water level control. We do that via the RWF55 PID controller that can be viewed via our touch screens and our, our DA and search and control panels. And we can also configure a number of the inputs um, in that specific RWF via the touch screen in this case. Okay. We can also span what we want to look at on the actual overview. On, the, on we want to go zero to 50 inches or 75 inches. You can you can basically configure your graphic water level uh, for both the DA and to the surge tank. Okay, then interfacing directly to or via an SEC master panel. So if we have our DA tank here and we want to connect it to a master panel for one common connection of all the boiler controls to our master panel and then have one connection for your building automation system to get information from all of those. It, it's very easy to do um, with our master panel arrangement. Again, as I said earlier, uh, the DA information that's sent to the master panel can be used to do user scripts um, and do some pretty neat math calculations. And then you can either graph those or trend those at the master panel. Uh, for instance, condensate return percentage would be one of those things I think I would want. Again, went through a lot of information here. Um, I'm gonna answer a couple questions that I got. Um, it was kind of interesting before I, I sign off here. Uh, I did get a question from um, uh, an end user. Um, who makes the best de-aerator? Um, that to me is pretty much a loaded question. Um, so I'm just gonna say that we can work with all manufacturers, all de-aerator manufacturers in the industry to provide a solution, not only for the de-aerator surge tank control, but a solution for your boiler room in order to ensure that the information needed to manage that boiler room efficiently and make the equipment last as long as it can and as optimum performance maintained and um, 
and we can do that for you for sure. Um, so who makes the best DA aerator? If you want to give me a call, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you talk to some DA manufacturers and, uh, and they can convince you which one is the best. But uh, good question for sure. Uh, another question uh, was, what chemicals do you add to the DA? This is a pretty complicated question. Uh, I'd love to talk to you on a, a, on a individual basis because it really depends upon uh, the program, the, the chemical program that your company or your chemical company has set up for you. Um, sulfites, for sure, you want to add to the DA because you want to give those sulfites some time to consume that oxygen before it heads, heads over to the to the boilers. But in some cases, you may have combination products where you have polymers, amines, sulfites, you know, caustic, all in one barrel. In that case, you may have to feed it to the deaerator in lieu of individual feed points like the feed water line or amines to the steam header. Okay, um, had a lot of other questions out there for sure. I um, I will definitely get back to you on, on those questions. And if you put your phone number down, I will actually call you and we can discuss a little bit further. But I do appreciate everyone's time. Thanks for coming and listening to me today. Um, we're going to be doing a lot more of these. I look forward to coming out and seeing customers again soon and maybe doing some seminars in your area or with some of your specifying engineers um, and also having you guys come out and visit us in Chicago. We have quite the training facility and quite the number of uh, people with decades of experience in the steam and boiler business. And we look forward to sharing some of that knowledge with you and learning something about your process and how you guys go to market. So again, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Uh, everybody have a great day and stay safe.